Hello, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's Society of Ohio Archivists January webinar, Crucial Conversations, Recognizing and Overcoming Racial Injustice and Bias. Um, I am your technical host, Betsy Hedler, with the Ohio History Connection. Um, just a few notes before we get started. We are recording this event, and it will be available on the um, Society of Ohio Archivists YouTube page afterward. Um, Please use the chat to report technical issues to me that you may have along the way. Um, if in the chat, if you select, uh, you select hosts and panelists um, to report technical issues, I will see that. If you'd like to chat with each other, please make sure that you have selected everyone as your, as your, as your option in the chat. Um, if you're having audio or video issues, most often the best solution is to exit and rejoin the event. You may ask questions through the Q&A. Um, please use the chat as previously noted to share comments or resources. Um, closed captioning is available for this webinar. To activate, click live transcript and select show subtitle from your meeting controls toolbar. toolbar. Now I will hand it over to Sherry Goody, the Gowdy president of the Society of Ohio Archivists to get us started. Good afternoon. I'm Sherry Gowdy, president of the Society of Ohio Archivists. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first program of 2022, <laughs> Crucial Conversations, Recognizing and Overcoming Racial Injustice and Bias. Thanks to the Social Justice and Black Lives Matter Task Force for organizing this panel, and to Betsy Hedler and the Ohio History Connection for providing technical facilitation of this program. I want to take a moment to thank the task force and council members for working through the holiday break to respond to Ohio's House Bill 327, an outrageous and devastating bit of legislation that threatens to restrict the teaching of honest history and our ability to provide a thorough examination of our past. If you'd like to check out SOA's statement on House Bill 327, please go to our website. Before I introduce our moderator and speakers, I'd like to make a few comments about our topic today and the critical need that we as archivists, librarians, public historians, and memory workers have to take part in this discussion today. We are amid a reckoning. At this very moment, we are experiencing history, racial and social injustice, a worsening pandemic, economic instability, social unrest, systems collapse, and the promise of democracy in peril. How can we ensure the events we are going through right now are adequately and honestly told in the future? We are aware of the silences of the past and revisionist retellings of events in our history. Our history is filled with lost cause mythology from the discovery and founding of our country to the glorification of the South and the Civil War to the big lie of the election of 2020. We as public historians are integral to this moment and how it's remembered. When those in the future look back, how will they know the truth? Will they see a whole picture with all its glaring reality? How will they know our joy, our devastation, our hopes and our despair? Will we combat the desire and effort to mythologize this moment and instead provide the beacons of truth that this moment calls for? I hope today's discussion will provide us all with tools that we need to be good stewards for our communities, for our country, and for one another. Now, let's get to today's discussion. I'd like to introduce our moderator and speakers. Ms. Geraldine Barbie is the Assistant Director of the National Afro-American Museum and Cultural Center. The museum is part of the Ohio History Connection System of Historic Sites and Museums. At the NAAMCC, Ms. Barbie manages marketing, museum curation, and programming activities and staff. She has over 35 years of experience developing innovative community-based programs and service delivery coordination for federally and foundation-funded programs. She has professional and volunteer experience in the area of program administration, fundraising, media relations, and special event planning. Ms. Barbie raised over $4 million for nonprofit organizations from federal agencies, corporate, and private foundations. A native of Memphis and parent of an adult son, Ms. Barbie's hobbies include gardening, gourmet cooking, travel, and playing with her dog, Mia. 
Mr. Eric Deggins is NPR's first full-time TV critic, appearing on all of the network shows, including Morning Edition, Here and Now, and All Things Considered, writing for NPR.org, and appearing on podcasts such as Life Kit, Code Switch, and Pop Culture Happy Hour. He is also author of a book dissecting how media outlets use prejudice and stereotypes to build ratings and power, entitled Race Bader, How the Media Wields Dangerous Words to Divide a Nation, which was published in October 2012 by Paul Grave Macmillan. Mr. Dave Snyder is a white evangelical Christian with a calling to develop genuine multi-ethnic unity within the local church and within the local community. Black Lives Matter Cincinnati creates conversations on race with those least comfortable being in conversations about race, bringing a perspective that is based on biblical teaching. Through Black Lives Matter Cincinnati social media, he engages white evangelicals, Trump supporters, white progressives, and eagerly welcomes black allies. Thank you to our speakers, Mr. Deggins and Mr. Snyder, and thank you to our moderator, Ms. Barbie. And now I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you so much for joining us today. Everyone on the call We've got a great turnout, and we really appreciate you guys supporting this great conversation. So I'm going to start with Eric um, and welcome him um, to Ohio virtually, as well as whoever we have joined us from around the country. So Eric, you know, I've listened to you on NPR, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of your uh, pieces or heard all of your pieces rather. So I just wanted to kind of give you a chance to go ahead and, and get started with your part of the presentation. And if you want to give us an overview of what you want to talk about before you get started, that'd be great. Um, sure. So as you see, uh, I'm sharing my screen with you because I'm going to use a PowerPoint. Uh, I find that's the easiest way to sort of get through uh, these presentations and thank you, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, it's really impressive the number of people that you've gotten uh, to get together on Zoom to talk about this very important issue. And I think it's a great way to sort of kick off um, awareness and thinking as we head into this weekend before the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And I'm sure a lot of us will be attending other events over the weekend and on Monday. And this is a great way to sort of position us to be thinking about these issues. Um, I, I'm, I admit, you know, I love talking about this stuff and I get very, uh, inter you know, excited about it. So I may talk a little longer than I'm supposed to. So I'm going to apologize in advance. And if it seems like I'm going too fast, I apologize. But once we're done, uh, hopefully we'll be able to have a little back and forth and I can answer any questions you might have about some of the stuff I've said. So, so when I um, do these kinds of presentations, the first thing I have to admit is that I have a pretty cool job, all right? I get paid to watch television. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I don't think some people out there heard me. I get paid to watch television. I know, and I get paid I to you. hang out with some really cool people. So uh, this is just an example of some of the stuff I've done. I interviewed uh, David Letterman during his last couple of weeks before he retired. Um, I interviewed the queen of all media, Oprah Winfrey, when she was doing live events across the country. I guest hosted uh, the CNN's media show Reliable Sources a few times a few years ago. And then I also uh, got a chance to hang out with Diddy as you do, right? But my real <laughs> job is being a watchdog on how TV and media affects us all. And so that means anything from the work that I do for NPR to appearing on Full Frontal with Samantha B and talking about how journalists can cover Trump or interviewing uh, the correspondents from The Daily Show for South by Southwest, or talking on local television about how television has been changed by COVID-19. And one of the most important things I think we need to keep an eye on is how race, identity, difference, and inclusion plays out in media. So I'm always talking about that, whether I'm talking about diversity in, in award shows like the Emmys, or I'm keeping an eye on Tucker Carlson, or I'm talking about uh, The Bachelor and diversity. Oh my God. <laughs> we'll talk later if you have some, something about that. But, um, but basically, you know, all of our weirdness and, uh, and, and our problems in dealing and talking about race. It comes out in media and in, and in particular, it comes out in television. So it's convenient to keep an eye on and see how these issues are evolving by seeing how TV um, evolves. So the thing I always try to um, get people to keep in mind is that we're in a situation where we're in a country that is, of course, increasingly becoming more diverse. Um, when I wrote my book, <coughs> the year 
when uh, it was expected that America's population would get to the point where there was no group, uh, ethnic group that was in the, uh, the majority, um, white, white people would essentially be outnumbered by the aggregate number of non-white people. Uh, we thought that was gonna happen in 2050. Now that's been lowered to 2045. Um, so, so in just a few years relatively within um, you know, our lifetimes, white people are expected to be less than half of the population. And some of you may know that there's an idea out there in social science called the group threat theory. This idea that uh, when uh, groups that are viewed as a minority in a larger group start to grow in power, then the majority group feels threatened and they react. And you can look at poll numbers, for example, that indicate that, you know, there are lots of people out there who feel that uh, the increasing diversity of America isn't necessarily a good thing uh, for the country. And 31% uh, of all Americans, so one third of all Americans and half of all Republicans have this point of view and even 13% of Democrats. Uh, so, and I, and I think one reason why that happens is because of group threat theory and also because uh, of all the stereotypes that we have about people of color and about what happens when people of color gain power within American society. So people like to think, especially around this time, <laughs> as we uh, come up to MLK, uh, MLK's holiday, and then we go into Black History Month, people wanna think of America's progress on civil rights issues as this sort of straight line towards justice, right? Civil war ends, um, black, black males get the vote. And then we flash forward to uh, the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and the mid 60s. And, you know, black people finally get the right to vote and segregation is officially struck down. And then we flash forward to Barack Obama gets elected and we have the nation's first black president and everybody celebrates and the credits roll. <laughs> but, but you guys know, and historians uh, across the world know, that the real story is one of progress and backlash, progress and backlash. When black males got the right to vote after the end of the Civil War, uh, of course we had the redemption uh, come along and, uh, and, and the installation of, of Jim Crow laws uh, uh, throughout the South and throughout the country. And you know, when civil rights um, um, action um, you know, reached Congress in the mid 1960s, we had a backlash to that as well, right? So, uh, and, and all of that I think is fueled by this group threat theory. When there is a major advance towards equality um, that, that, that helps non-white people gain power in America, there is a backlash, the group threat theory engages and we see a backlash to that. And, and, and understanding that, and understanding that right now we're probably in the middle of one of these backlashes triggered uh, by the success of um, civil rights uh, struggles in the wake of George Floyd's murder uh, and, um, and the election of Joe Biden, you know, understanding that helps us understand the times that we're in now, right? Um, I have a number of tough ideas that sometimes I have to deliver uh, when I give presentations like this. Uh, they may not be tough ideas for you guys if you've studied and kept up with how race works in America, but for some people, it's a tough idea to accept. And the tough idea number one that I present is that American society socializes us all to elevate white culture over others, to consider white culture as both the norm and the ideal. And media is often the medium for that message. You know, uh, James Bond has been around for 60 years. He's always been a British white male. Uh, when we look at uh, the top um, superheroes that were cultivated by Marvel Studios, we see that they're all uh, white males. And in fact, you know, four of the actors who play them are all named Chris, right? Uh, okay, Steve Trevor is, is, a, is a DC character, but um, the, the other three characters came from Marvel. I know we got some comic book nerds out there, so uh, I'm trying to come correct. Um, but, but the idea is that um, we have this socialization in place and, and it's important to recognize that it's happening so that we can take action against it and try to dismantle it rather than ignore it and pretend that it doesn't happen, right? Um, and, and the way that that um, socialization 
and the, the supremacy of white racial culture in America is maintained is often through systemic racism. This idea that racism is reflected in societal disparities relating to wealth, income, criminal justice, employment, housing, healthcare, education, political power, all these different systems in America that are um, unconsciously sometimes, unknowingly sometimes calibrated to elevate white culture over non-white culture. And, and that's why tackling these ideas can be such a challenge sometimes because we're, ta we're trying to get people to believe in something that the system itself is encouraging people to not believe. And then we're trying to get them to see it in all these different areas, uh, criminal justice, employment, housing, healthcare. Um, you know, why are, do Black people disproportionately die uh, from COVID? Um, you know, why are Black people disproportionately killed by police? You know, we, we have all these indicators in society that there's a problem and trying to get people to wake up to them is, is a, a really important uh, uh, agenda. And in fact, um, what we can see is that all these issues that are that are centered in race that we have conflicts over, I think can be kind of traced to this central question of how does systemic racism and prejudice work in America? So we may um, look at the rates of, of deaths from COVID and say, why are black Americans dying at twice the rate of white Americans? Or we can you know, look at issues of police brutality and ask why are black people disproportionately killed by police um, uh, even in, in situations where they're unarmed. Um, we can ask about you know, the legacy of slavery and, and why hasn't America ever had a version of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that they had in South Africa. But all these things I think kind of uh, trace back to this central question about systemic racism, does it exist? And, and if it does exist, how do we fight it? Um, the greatest enabler of white privilege in America is that white racial culture is treated as if it's in, invisible and universal. Uh, white people are not encouraged to believe they have a racial culture or to articulate it or to see how it operates in systems in America. And so one of the big struggles when it comes to civil rights and getting people to pay attention to systemic racism is getting people to understand that white people have a racial culture too and that it affects everything in society. Um, one of the things that I try to do is identify types of racism. Uh, I teach a class at Duke University. I give presentations like this at colleges and different places. And I found that there are four types of racism that tend to distort media, especially news media. And if you can make people aware of this, these types of racism, then you'll be surprised at how often you'll see it pop up in some of the things that you watch uh, on television or some of the things that you consume online or in newspapers and print. So the first one I have is bigotry denial syndrome. And the uh, avatar for this is my good friend, Megan Kelly, right? So the idea is that um, people walk around, there are some people who walk around and say, I'm not a bigot. I don't believe my race is superior to anybody else's race. So therefore I can't enable racism and prejudice, but we know that that's not true. And also what we know is that by denying that you can uh, unconsciously or without thought uh, enable racism uh, and prejudice, uh, you're more likely to be susceptible to doing exactly that. And I think uh, Megyn Kelly is a good example of this. Um, Megyn Kelly, of course, was a, an anchor for Fox News where she um, quite frankly did indulge in, in some of the things that that channel did in terms of race baiting. And then she tried to get a job at NBC where she would be a more general news anchor, but she found that some of her uh, tendencies from when she was an anchor on Fox News sort of came, sort of surfaced in her morning show on NBC and caused a problem. Here she was talking with a panel uh, about Halloween costumes and the idea of whether it was okay for white people to put on makeup to darken their skin kind of came up. And this is what she said. Let's check out this clip. What is racist? Because, because so truly, you do get in trouble if you are a white person who puts on yes. black face yes. on Halloween or a black person who puts on white face yes. for Halloween. Like, I, back, okay, back when I was a kid, that was okay as long as you were dressing up as like a character. Yeah. There was a controversy on The Real Housewives of New York with Luann as she dresses Diana Ross and she made her skin look darker than it really is. And people said that that was racist. And I don't know, I felt like, 
who doesn't love Diana Ross? She wants to look like Diana Ross for one day. I, I don't know how like that got racist on Halloween. I okay, so, so that exchange happens. It causes this huge controversy. Um, um, uh, Al Roker and Craig Melvin, two black anchors who work on the Today Show, who appear in, in programs right before her show, actually had a discussion on air to denounce what she said. Um, and, but to me, her reaction was a, was a perfect distillation of BDS. First of all, um, what, what disappointed me about this discussion is that um, it, it, it's all white people having this discussion. So they're talking about blackface, something related to a core issue involving how black people are defined in America. And there are no non-white people in this discussion. Um, and, and also she seems quite ignorant of the history of blackface because it's not just the idea that it's an, a, an offensive thing to do for white people uh, to, to take on um, the appearance of black people in that way. There's a historical connection to blackface that she was completely unaware of and, and didn't even really seem to feel the need to be aware of while she was having that conversation. So normally if this was a class, I would ask you guys to tell me um, uh, what she was missing about blackface, but I'll just tell you that, um, and, and I'm sure a lot of you guys know this already, blackface was also this instrument by which white people demonized black people uh, in the wake of the advances that they had made uh, after the Civil War. So after the Civil War, um, you know, black people, black males at least, get the right to vote. And we see something like 2,000 uh, black men elected to legislators in different posts uh, throughout the South. And of course, uh, that really scared the white supremacists uh, who are used to being in power in the South. Um, so all of a sudden we get these minstrel shows where white people are putting on dark makeup to pretend to be black people. We get movies um, um, like Birth of a Nation where the black characters are played by white people. And these black characters are venal, they're violent, they're stupid, they're lazy. It's a way of spreading stereotypes about black people without even involving black people. And so um, when, when you indulge in bigotry denial syndrome, you miss these things because you're so busy insisting that you're not racist and you can't possibly echo racism that you don't bother to learn about these issues and understand uh, really why something uh, is considered offensive, why something is outside the bounds of polite expression. And so insisting that blackface isn't a big deal sort of ignores a whole chunk of history. Um, that's really important. So, um, you know, unfortunately that, well, maybe fortunately that resulted in, in, uh, in Megyn Kelly uh, sort of losing her job at NBC. And unfortunately, in the heat of all that, I don't think people really understood what she did wrong or, or how she could have done it better. But it was a case of, B, uh, of BDS, bigotry denial syndrome. So bigotry denial syndrome is the first one. The second one is situational racism. And there's a great clip from the movie Do the Right Thing that kind of sums up situational racism. Um, uh, Spike Lee plays a delivery guy for a pizza joint, uh, an Italian-owned uh, pizza joint in a black neighborhood. And he uh, steps up to the oldest son who's working in the pizzeria and confronts him about why he uses the N-word all the time to talk about black people uh, when so many people that he actually admires are actually black. Let's check it out. Can I talk to you for a second? What? Pino, who's your favorite basketball player? Magic Johnson. Who's your favorite movie star? Eddie Murphy. Who's your favorite rock star? Prince. You're a prince. Boss, Bruce. Prince. Bruce. Pino, all you ever talk about is nigga this and nigga that. And all your favorite people are so-called niggas. It's different. Magic, Eddie, Prince are not niggas. I mean, they're not black. I mean, let me explain myself. They're, they're not really black. I'm, I mean, they're black, but they're not really black. They're, they're more than black. It's, it's, it's different. It's different? Yeah, to me, it's, it's different. You know, deep down inside, I think you wish you were black. Get the fuck out of here. Laugh if you want to. You know, your hair is kinkier than mine. So, situational racism is this idea of having prejudiced stereotypes that are visited against some people of color, but not all people of color. And um, particularly if you're a person of color, you may have seen this in your own life, where there are people 
um, who, um, in, in Pino's case, there were Black people in his experience who he elevated out of the stereotypes and prejudice that he had about Black people in general. So when an athlete or a performer or someone he admired would sort of do something that he thought was notable, then all of a sudden he didn't even consider them to really be Black people. Um, but in general, he had all these stereotypes and prejudices about Black people that he kind of deployed against all the Black people that he would, um, you know, um, that he would encounter in his everyday life. And so this is another way in which people uh, um, sort of exacerbate racism, but assure themselves that they're not racist because there's some people of color that they don't feel these things about. Situational racism, uh, racism that depends on the situation. The third type is strategic racism. And of course, um, we've seen this before. We've seen this in how um, you know, former President Donald Trump talks about undocumented immigrants, for example. Um, taking marginalized groups, exacerbating prejudices about them, and using those prejudices to uh, achieve material goals. That's strategic racism. You're not racist uh, just because you believe these things about these people. Uh, you're, you're deploying that racism in order to gain wealth, power or some sort of advantage. And um, you know, one way we've seen this is in convict leasing. Again, uh, historians know that a system arose in the wake of the Civil War and the end of slavery, where people who were convicted of crimes uh, were forced to work off their sentences in hard labor. Uh, and so that allowed all of these industries in the South that depended on slave labor to prosper, to have a new source of slave labor, which is essentially convicts, and of course, it encouraged communities throughout the South to criminalize being black and to uh, arrest black people for vagrancy if they were within the town limits after five or 6 p.m. sundown laws. Uh, something that was going on until 1927. And in some ways it was worse than slavery because if you pay money for someone, uh, you want them to stay healthy and work for you and procreate for as long as possible. But if you're paying uh, the state of Georgia 200 bucks a head for a convict and one of them uh, dies from being overworked in the field or dies in a mine collapse or dies from unsafe working conditions, they'll just send you another. Um, so um, this is something to be aware of, strategic racism used to achieve material goals. And then finally, the, the fourth type is white privilege, benefits extended in society to white people that are often taken for granted and unspoken, being the generic. Uh, being the objective standard of beauty. I wanted to test this theory that white people were the um, uh, objective standard of beauty uh, for um, society. And so I went on to um, Google search and I just put in the term attractive women. And this is the image result that I got. And if you look at all these images, you will see one, maybe two women who are not white in something like you know, over 20 images, maybe 24 images. So even, uh, even Google search thinks that attractive women are mostly white. Um, being a symbol of yourself, not your race. So if something happens, some crazy person shoots up a mall or something, it's not considered evidence of some racial uh, dynamic. That person is just considered uh, to have a problem. And then finally, you're presumed innocent. You're not a criminal, affirmative action beneficiary or troublemaker unless you earn that distinction. And it's hard sometimes for people to understand how much of a privilege that is, but people of color in your life will tell you uh, that is certainly a privilege. So um, we are in this situation, often people will say, you know, race is a social construct. It's not a biological thing. And, and that's a, you know, it's a laudable statement because you're trying to say that we're mostly the same, even though we don't necessarily look the same. But race is a concept that has evolved in society to try and also help explain your family history, your community history. There are um, some really um, interesting and important things that are wrapped up in uh, how we define race. But the problem is, that those things have been weaponized to justify slavery, particularly in America's early history. We had so many people coming to America in its early beginnings who were devoutly religious and opposed to um, putting people into slavery. So, but they also had all these industries that required um, the, the, uh, the free and cheap labor of slavery to prosper. So you go over to Africa, you find all these people and you define them as not people. And then you come up with this whole ration of rationalizations to prove 
that they are not people. And even now, 400, 500 years later, we are struggling with trying to unwind and unpack and, 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 uh, and defang all of those uh, justifications that were used uh, to, to somehow explain why people of color were substandard and they deserve to live their lives in bondage. Uh, I think one of the greatest achievements of Martin Luther King Jr. era's civil rights movement is that it made the expression of open racism unacceptable. Um, it made it to the point where people couldn't use the N-word, white people couldn't use the N-word to refer to, to Black people in, in uh, socially polite settings without uh, being considered having made a huge transgression. And how do we know this? Even white supremacists don't want to be called racist. I couldn't believe it when I saw this sign for this white supremacist podcast where uh, they're claiming, hey, you know, we're not racist. We may think white people should run everything, but but we're not racist. So, um, so, so at least we have had that advance. And that is something that has not been rolled back uh, in some of these, um, in some of the backlashes that we've seen. And it's just up to us to kind of keep pushing, right? Mm -hmm. So our biggest challenges now are to encourage people to see racism outside of individual acts of intolerance, to see the systemic racism. That's the big difference, I think, in how Fox News and the Wall Street Journal editorial page and some conservative oriented media outlets, how they talk about race and how um, outlets that are more interested in social justice talk about race. This conflict over whether systemic racism exists and whether it should be vanquished in society. Let's convince people that challenging their vision of America is not intended to be an insult to them. It's not intended to be an assault on their values. It's just intended to make things more equal for everyone. And we also need to show that equality is not a zero sum game. White people will not lose by making people of color more equal. We'll have a society where our greatest minds can be put on the front lines of every problem. That will make society prosper for everyone. And one of the great lies of racism is that um, initiatives aimed at increasing equality for non-white people somehow victimize white people. Uh, if, if that happens, they're not being applied well, they should be changed, but they can be changed. And, and, and in fact, they have to be changed because uh, you know, given how this country is becoming more and more diverse, we have to address these issues. We have to figure out how to get rid of the systemic racism so we can harness the full power of American society. So thank you so much for letting me give this presentation. I apologize for burning through it so quick, but uh, I was only supposed to be for 20 minutes and I'm sure I, I spoke longer than that. So thanks a lot. And I look forward to taking your questions and having a discussion later. Okay, thank you, Eric. That was so insightful and, you know, some raised some questions I have, but, but I won't get into any questions yet. I'll just go ahead and maybe ask Dave to come on camera so we can um, into his part of the discussion. <clears throat> Hello, Dave. Um, did you, you do have a PowerPoint, right? Or you so have, I can't remember if you had comments. I do have a PowerPoint, yeah, yes. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, so I'm gonna let you work on that. Um, but I will comment a little bit on Eric's thing. I, I would ask everybody, he put up one of my favorite, was a book, but also there's a video version of Slavery by Another Name. I showed it at the museum a lot because people don't realize that slavery did not end with the 15th Amendment. I mean, they know they know the background of how um, Reconstruction kind of fell apart, but the real story of police oppression and also societal oppression that happened as a result of what happened in Reconstruction and that whole idea of you being able just to be jailed for loitering and next thing you know, you're on a chain gang or you're working on a, on a road. So it's a very good document. It's called Slavery by Another Name. And I would you'd encourage people to watch that as part of their Black History Month um, education. So Dave, are you ready? I am, Sherilyn. Okay, go right ahead. So the, thanks, thanks for having me today, and and uh, um, uh, good good stuff there, Eric. Yeah, you, you're so right about the backlash, and uh, I'm I'm coming at it from a different angle, but uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about two initiatives that I'm involved with, and 
we are, we actually target those people. I'm, I'm going to coin a new term here, Eric, and I'm going to call it the foot soldiers of the backlash. Yep. But I'm going to disclaimer up front, I'm not an expert, but I'm going to share my story and seek to learn together. And I think I'm already out of the closet. Uh, I'm coming out of the closet today. And I say that because when I talk about race, I do everything I can to keep politics out of the discussion and to make it so that people cannot tell my political perspective, because I find that if you mix the two, uh, it, it becomes impossible from my perspective to solve uh, problems with race. You end up getting dragged in a direction you don't want to go. But I, I know that many of you are, are must be asking, well, a white evangelical, how does that work with a Black Lives Matter? So I, I'm just going to give you some of the basic things that I believe. And right up front, I believe that systemic racism is real and persistent. I also believe that we are not morally superior to those that are at stage one of the racial identity development process. As Ibram Kendi tells us, we all have the capacity to think, say, and do things that increase racial disparities. We all have the capacity to support policies that increase racial disparities. So who is Black Lives Matter group? We're a Facebook discussion group. We're not the typical uh, Black Lives Matter chapter. We're not here to uh, do protests. We also, our, our intent isn't to support activists. We specifically target those least comfortable with having conversations on race. And we do our effort to pull those people into conversations on race. And our membership, you know, it's a small group. We see we got a little bit of diversity there, but uh, as probably no surprise to you, we are challenged to pull white conversation white conservatives into the conversation and even more challenged to pull white evangelicals into conversations on race. Our rules of engagement, we focus on discussing various words, actions, and policies that we think oppress black America. And we invite anyone into that discussion, including people that will openly say they don't believe systemic racism exists. Now, when someone new comes into the group, it, it can be shocking to them that we allow these people even into the group. But I feel these people are the exact people we need to be building bridges with and in pulling into the conversation on race. So let's talk about the content that we create and feature. The first category of content is content that identifies where status establishment policies or practices oppress Black America. And you may disagree with us on um, you know, the impact of various policies, but I find that when we focus on what is the impact to Black America of this action or, or this policy, it can build bridges to people that disagree with you. And we use this content this is the content we use to go outside the group to recruit, to make a connection with somebody who's a white conservative and then pull them into the group where we can then have uh, future conversations on other aspects of race. We do create content that targets white evangelicals, but frankly, uh, this, this content is, it gets less engaged. We have a harder time generating generating conversations on it, less likes, less shares. And we talk a lot about systemic racism. We talk a lot about how this action or this policy impacts Black America. And Eric gave a great definition for systemic racism. I'll, I'll just say it again in different words. I, I, I think I'm saying the same thing. But any system, not, not an individual who's got bias or animosity, but any system that increases the racial disparity. Now, when we talk about, when we recognize racial disparities and systems that are causing it, 
and talk about that in our group, invariably somebody will uh, push back and, and they'll say, but I don't believe systemic racism exists. Well, the facts of the disparity are indisputable. So I will ask them, what do you think is the cause of this disparity? And invariably, they will point to something like, well, it's dysfunctional culture in Black America. Okay, your perceived dysfunctional culture, but what causes that? Is it that Black people are inferior, either their DNA or their innate culture that goes back hundreds of years? Or is there some external force that is influencing Black America? One of the most popular responses is, well, it's the war on poverty. You know, maybe I wouldn't say it's the war on poverty. Maybe I would point to manufacturing jobs disappearing in the 70s and uh, jobs not being accessible to Black communities or the 94 crime bill. But if they say the war on poverty, I say, well, you have just identified a system that was impacting uh, the disparities from Black America. That, that, by our definition, is systemic racism. And the backlash increases even more because there is a need to not admit that systemic racism exists because that would threaten the narrative that these individuals have, have embraced and believed their entire lives that the reason why Black America experiences disparities is because they are inferior. And if they have, have to rethink that and embrace that there is an external force that is causing these disparities, or at least having a strong influence in these disparities, then they can no longer be comfortable with the status quo, which means they would be compelled to take action. I'm gonna talk about a, a second initiative that I'm involved with. It's a, a small group, multiracial experiential journey that we put our rising leaders through, our, our rising deacons, elders, the staff at our multi-ethnic church. And our small groups, we ensure that the group is at least a third people of color, which is facilitated by one white and one black facilitator. These are the, the topics that we, we put people through. And we found before we found this experience, we could not talk about topics of race. Our leaders, our elders, our staff people just couldn't talk about topics of race. When a topic of race came up, there would be a gut reaction. People would be uncomfortable and just couldn't have that conversation. And as you can imagine, in a multi-ethnic church, race touches everything. Now that we are doing this small group experience, we're starting to pull people in from the community as well. It has uh, changed perspectives. So I'm going to give you some of the things that I've learned about injustice and bias. And the, the first thing is, I believe that we need to constantly ask on every action, every policy, how does this impact Black America? And I think that we, this is something we've got to train ourselves to do. And one of, one of the reasons why uh, it's important that we do this is it, it is, it is a, it is a method of seeing Black America. We, we give dignity and value to Black America when we actually see the disparities that are happening. Because for 400 years, we have deliberately been avoiding seeing Black America. That's why we've got servant staircases, servants uh, entries, segregated schools, segregated communities, segregated bathrooms, all constructed so we don't have to interact with and see for ourselves the reality that uh, Black America lives life differently than white America. Now, one of the key things for me is coming to the realization that we are not morally superior to those at stage one of the racial identity development 
process. The reality is that we all have gone through that development process at some point in our lives. The, the things that Megan Kelly believes, even those of us uh, that are white that are stage five of the racial identity development process, we went through that process ourselves. And along with that, I've come to realize that it's not about transforming hearts is, it's important, but that's insufficient. Transforming hearts doesn't remove bias. We all have bias. And just because someone has their heart transformed, that doesn't solve systemic racism. There's this common belief that racism is merely animosity and uh, people that haven't had their hearts transformed. And if I've had my heart transformed, then I'm not part of the problem. So I don't, even, I don't need to be part of the solution. Now, the work I do with uh, uh, people that I'll call the um, backlash foot soldiers, it's hard work because you're dealing with gut reactions, not rational thinking. But I've learned that we can reprogram our own biases. We can do that by practicing empathy, exchanging personal stories with other people. But I've also learned that uh, for that to go well, you need to have those interactions be facilitated. Now I'm gonna share just one more interaction with you or one more initiative. And that is a elementary school that's five minutes from my home. And I just believe that education disparity is the social justice issue of our time. This school has had failing grades for 21 years, and I'm part of a team of about 24. We mentor and uh, tutor at the school. My major contribution was I started a soccer program that uh, we did, I, I managed for five years and then passed the baton to someone else. I noticed recently the statistic that this community is 70% black but the school is 95% black. Well, why the difference? I came to realize it's because middle-class white families move into the community because they get a nice price on the housing. And they also get vouchers. The state provides vouchers to this community because of the failing schools. And these, these families then turn around the white kids end up uh, living in the community, but they, they, their children go to schools outside the community. And for whatever reason, the black single parent, often generation coming from generational poverty, those families, those children coming from that environment are not uh, availing that uh, voucher system. The, the problem is complex. I'm asking myself, how do you solve that? I, I realize that the state of Ohio is, uh, is trying to solve it, but the solutions they put forth, they sound like good solutions, but they haven't worked. And in many cases, they might even aggravate the problem. So how do we fix this injustice? Well, Jesus gives us a template for reparations. It's called the parable of the Good Samaritan. Reparations has two dimensions, restitution and repair. This parable focuses on repair. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Dr. King said that Black America is that man robbed, beaten and bleeding, lying by the side of the road. That Black America has been robbed of his personhood, stripped of his sense of dignity. I would say based on the factual disparities between black and white America, what Dr. King said then is still true today. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite when he came to the place and saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity. 
He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for an extra, any extra expense you may have. It's important to note that this Samaritan was not one of the robbers. He did not owe restitution. What this Samaritan did was an act of sacrificial love. It went beyond what the law required. Dr. King warned against reparations merely being transactional or an actuarial calculation. Dr. King pointed this to this parable and said, reparations demands the giving of one's soul. Both the church and our government have failed to repair that man that was robbed, beaten, and lying, bleeding by the side of the road. It's time for us as individuals to repair and restore those impacted by injustice. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, we have a few questions. I'm gonna have to go back and forth. I'm asking people to please put their questions in the Q&A section versus the chat. I'll, I'll kind of scroll back through to see if I can capture the ones that are in the chat. But um, the first question is, what does Dave mean when he says that white culture is normative, normative? Does he mean that it's treated as the norm in our society, as Eric suggested, as well that it, or, as, or is it some sort of uh, object norm, subjective norm, sorry, let me do it again. What does Dave mean when he says white culture is normative? Does he mean that it's treated as the norm in our society, as Eric suggested, or, as, or is it something that is ob an objective norm? Okay, so I'm gonna use my church as an example because um, my experiences there have really transformed me. And my fellow white congregants, our, our church was 2% black 12 years ago and, and today it's 23% and it, it happened over uh, say 12 years. But the things we do, we've been doing for 150 years and we, we uh, just call it normal. It's a uh, normative culture. It's what we've been doing. But really, we point, it's white culture. We don't even stop to think that there are, there are other cultures out there. And as these people are coming to our church, that people are coming from different backgrounds. We do the same thing with theology. We just use the word theology when really what we mean, I mean, we say Black theology or Asian theology or or liberation theology, but when we talk about white Western theology or, or white American theology, we just say theology because to us it's normative. Okay, um, let's see. Sorry about There's that. A, Let me. Uh, no, I'd go like ahead. To, go ahead. I'd like to break in. Um, what I would say uh, is that, with all due respect, using the word normative, I think, is an issue. Um, Part of the problem that we have in trying to facilitate conversation across racial lines and culture lines is a, it, trying to get people to get rid of this idea that their culture, whatever it is, is the normal culture and that the cultures that they're reaching out to that they don't understand are somehow not normal. Uh, so, so using the word normative to describe any culture, whether it's a hybrid one that you've created with um, your, your increasingly diverse um, uh, church congregation, or whether it's referring to the way that white culture dominates uh, American society, uh, I, I, I think that's a really bad idea um, because you don't wanna make people who are in cultures that are different than yours feel as if you're asserting some sort of superiority. That is the, the key to how white culture has been invisible in America and been accepted as some sort of objective, normal standard that everyone should, uh, uh, should strive to reach. Uh, and, it, and, and in that way, it encourages white supremacy in ways that people don't realize. 
So we we, we got to get away from from that sort of thing, and we got to get we got to move towards respecting everyone's culture and saying that's their culture and it makes sense uh, for them, and they mo- they may want to retain elements of it even as they start to intersect with other cultures in America. Okay. Um, I have another question. Um, does Black Lives Matter Cincinnati group speak or involve Black folks in the community at any point of these discussions? And I did want to know, because I did notice on your statistics of the breakdown of your membership of Black Lives Matter, there were only 4% of the people were uh, Black. That's an estimation, yes. So we do have, um, we do have group members that are black and at various times uh, they, they interact, they submit material and they post it. But you know, I have found that they quite often weary and get tired of, of interacting with people that are still in the early stages of the racial identity development process. And so, you know, it, it takes a lot of patience to stick with it. Um, you know, one thing I would note is that um, particularly during the summer after George Floyd's murder, um, I did a lot of interviews with experts who were working on anti-racism. And, and anti-racism is this idea that simply walking around and saying that you're not racist isn't really enough to um, dismantle systemic racism in society. If you, if you really believe that you're not racist and you don't want to see racist systems in your environment, then uh, you really should take action in some way, however small, to combat racism, systemic racism in, in your environment. Um, and so uh, when, when you accept that that's one of the definitions of, of really combating uh, racism, part of that is um, white allies learning how to support that anti-racism effort. And a big part of that is lifting up the voices of people of color and letting them define the struggle against racism. And it's the hardest thing I think sometimes for white allies to do because unconsciously they are so used to controlling the conversation and controlling the uh, institutions that that fight um, um, some of these battles. But the most important thing that any white ally ally can really do is uplift the voices of people of color, help them figure out how to fight racism, and then support them in their fight. Yep. So, and then it kind of leads into the next question. Uh, white, White supremacy has been reframed as white inferiority complex. I'd like to get both of you guys' thoughts on that statement that white supremacy has been reframed as a white inferiority complex. Well, it seems to me that that that's two different things, that that's describing two different things. Um, white supremacy is, is, can be defined a lot of different ways, but for the purposes of the conversation we're having today, I think I would define it as the result of systemic racism. Um, and, and so we're constantly trying to figure out how to dismantle systemic racism in order to eliminate white cultural supremacy in America. Uh, white inferiority complex uh, could be defined. I mean, I don't know what this uh, person means when they use the phrase, but it can be defined as uh, the, 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 what fuels the backlash. You know, when attempts to, dis- to dismantle systemic racism are successful, um, the group th- threat theory kicks in amongst white groups, mm-hmm. and uh, and and you know that might be a different way of say um, you know defining the group threat theory that I had described earlier. Dave, do you have a comment? No, I I haven't uh, really heard uh, that that comment before. Okay. Well, I want to ask, I'll take you back a little bit on this, because I guess that's this whole idea of separating, like you said, white systemic racism and this thought process 
that my theory of this fear of uh, critical race theory is that, well, you hear people all the time say, it'll make my kids feel bad. It'll make us feel bad if we, you know, tell the true story of American history. And to me, which leads into the start of being, well, are you saying that if you learn the real stories of American history, that you're going to feel inferior? And maybe that's what the person's trying to get to. I'm not sure, but that, you know, I just kind of would like you guys to maybe talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, so one of the things I said at the end of my presentation is that one of the things that's important is to challenge systemic racism uh, without, while also live, leaving people, without making people feel like you're challenging their values or you're demeaning their culture, right? And so I think the use of something like white inferiority complex um, is a pretty pejorative term, right? And, and, and it's a, almost a way of sort of dismissing the fears and the concerns that white people have as they see um, society becoming more uh, multicultural and the demand to address systemic racism growing in society. And um, what I've noticed is that there are a ton of different dynamics, a ton of different ways, avoidance mechanisms is what I call them, that uh, America has developed and that white people in particular have developed to avoid talking about their white racial culture, to avoid what, talking about systemic racism, mm -hmm. to avoid talking about how systemic racism reinforces the view that their racial culture is the culture of America. Um, and so um, that whole white inferiority complex that seems to be sort of outlined in that phrase, I think that's just an avoidance mechanism and so um, I would rather not engage with that. I would rather explain it and push it to the side and try to move forward. Um, but, but I do think that those kinds of feelings, however you define them, group fit theory, white inferiority complex, whatever, um, it's the uneasiness that comes from seeing uh, groups uh, make progress on civil rights issues and leaving white people wondering where do they stand in the discussion. And so what's important is to constantly talk with and engage with people and tell them where they, where they fit in this discussion. Because for some people, you're, in, you're introducing them to this whole world of concepts and ideas and dynamics that they have never considered before. And, and, and it's understandable that that would be frightening. But if you wanna live in a just America, you have to challenge these ideas. And, and there's lots of people out there who will make it easy and show you that it's not the frightening thing that some of the opponents of equality in our society would make you think it is. I certainly agree that you, it's important to uh, challenge those ideas and, and get them to think about using rational thought instead of just uh, a gut reaction that bypasses their their consciousness, which is, you know, a lot of these responses, they've been programmed from a young age to, uh, they have a gut reaction and that's the response that comes out. So, you know, I, I work to engage uh, analytically with them and find something uh, similar. So, you know, the, they have a reaction to people wanting to take down Confederate monuments. Nobody's really educated them on what the hazard is on, on Confederate monuments. And they think it's something, you know, their, their response is, well, you're removing history. So find another area where they certainly support uh, removing something that uh, they thought was history or the concept of reparations. You know, well, I, I just don't uh, support anything that would would uh, target giving something based on you know one race instead of another. Well, you you bring up that uh, America has a long history of giving uh, entitlements, and for most of America's history, black people have been excluded from those entitlements, whether it's farm aid or or the GI Bill or something like that. And so you find something that they agree with, 
that has that same concept that they are now having a good reaction to. And uh, I use that as the bridge. Okay. Um, the next question is to both of you. So you want to jump in. It says, um, what are your thoughts on John McWhorter's book, Woke Racism? I'm not sure if you both are familiar with the book. Um, I'm passingly familiar with it. I haven't actually read it. Um, but I've seen John McWhorter's work uh, and, and, and read it before. He's been published by NPR even. And I know he's considered an intellectual who's pushing back against uh, you know, woke culture or whatever. But I've always thought that he was a black intellectual who made white people feel comfortable with avoiding these questions of systemic racism in society. Um, I haven't read his book yet, but what I've heard of his book, I don't agree with. And I think there's an attempt out there um, both from conservatives, political conservatives, and from some people who might be considered more liberal or libertarian to demonize the attempt to bring equality uh, in some areas of discussion and in some areas of society by creating this idea of uh, woke as a pejorative, as something, as an insult. And, and, and you know, you um, have seen through my presentation I'm constantly talking about waking people up to things in society that they have been asleep to. And so I, I resist wholeheartedly this attempt to demonize the word woke. Are there people out there um, who, who are sort of unreasonable in the things that they're asking in terms of progressivism? Of course, but that doesn't mean that the core idea, which is waking people up to the systemic racism they have been encouraged to avoid and not pay attention to. That is the important idea there. And that is an idea that has tons of merit. And instead, what I see is McWhorter going on shows like Real Time with Bill Maher and making arguments for ignoring what trans people are saying about how they should be recognized in society and how they should be defined, or what gay people are saying about how they should be recognized and defined. Um, if, if we've learned anything from the civil rights struggles of the last 50 or 60 years, it's that the voices of the marginalized people are important to pay attention to. And it's time for America to wake up to what those groups need in order to feel like fully equal partners in American society. And, and to me, books like Woke Racism are the ex exact opposite of that effort. I've not yet read John's book. But I'll put it on my list. Okay. All right. Um, let me ask another question. Um, how can we also have conversations about racial justice, injustice, bias within groups of people of color? Uh, the person says, I worry about my experiences as a person of color getting dismissed because my ethnicity slash culture is not the topic in the news. What is the appropriate, well, I'm not sure what they meant. What is, what is appropriate not to overstep or overstate, but to also recognize that bias can occur with it? Um, well, it's hard, it's, it's hard for me to know how to answer that question without knowing a little bit more about the person who asked it. But uh, one of the things that I think we're facing in this moment is that different marginalized groups in America have elements of their oppression that are common and elements of their oppression that are very different. And so um, we've reached a point sometimes where some people are encouraging what I call an oppression Olympics, where uh, everybody's jostling to try and talk about how they're the most oppressed by American society. And in fact, you know, uh, McWhorter's book is about, um, you know, co-signing the feelings of some people who feel like they've been oppressed uh, because they're being asked to use pronouns differently or because they're being asked to um, think about how gender works a little differently. Um, but point of fact is that uh, in order to talk about systemic racism and how it impacts different uh, marginalized groups in America, we have to be prepared mm -hmm. to recognize that our journey is similar to others in, in some ways and, and not similar to others in some ways and respect the ways in which our journey is not similar. Gay people are oppressed in America differently than people of color, uh, especially black people are. 
Asian people face different challenges in America than African Americans do. And in fact, um, you know, black immigrants from Africa face different uh, challenges than African Americans who were born and raised in America. And so um, part of the struggle is finding our commonality and finding ways to connect, but also respecting the ways in which they're different and, and being good allies to people who need support in addressing the ways in which their oppression is different uh, than ours. And if you're talking about talking about equality within a group of people who are the same, but they're but they're all but they're all part of the same marginalized group, you know, we all have different levels of understanding. And I think the way you make progress is by being firm about your values and really working hard to understand how these issues work in society so that you're speaking from a place of knowledge and not a place of assumption, right? One of the big problems that we have when we talk about race is that people assume a lot of things and they have a lot of gut reactions to things. Uh, they'll say, you know, I know this person who did this thing over here. Or I know this person over here that this happened to. Well, let me see a study <laughs> that tells me what actually happened to a thousand people who were part of that group. Let me see larger dynamics beyond just the individual things that you experience in your life or the gut feeling that you have. My book, Race Bader, is filled with a lot of analysis of surveys and polls and studies to try and get a sense of what's happening on a larger scale uh, using data and not just talking about things that I've noticed or things that are part of my personal experience. So we have to bring that to our discussions. And then once you have those values, and once you know what's going on, and once you have a firm sense of what you think is going on and how you can address it, then you also have to be open-minded to other people's journey, whether they're within your uh, group, um, your ethnic and culture group, or whether they're outside of it. Dave, do you have a comment? So the question is, uh, having those conversations within my pot groups um, right yeah it, i don't know that i've uh i got anything to add to that you know i've i i focus on uh trying to share across uh, with uh, mixed groups and the, the challenge that i've found is that when uh people of color start sharing what their experience has been that it, it's typical for white people to say, yeah, but you're just speaking as an individual. Uh, let's, let's stop looking at groups as having common experiences and uh, things in common, because that's one of the things that feels threatening for uh, many white individuals is actually seeing the uh, common experiences and, uh, but. Okay. Um, another question we have is, um, how should one specifically counter efforts to eliminate the teaching of critical race theory? I mean, what can we do? I think maybe even as, you know, I, I was gonna ask this question even in terms of um, archivists or me being a, a history prof a museum professional, because we're struggling with this with this whole idea within our whole organization, and I admit there is some angst about how to deal with this politically. So, I I pretty much ignore CRT, and when it comes up, I steer people back, and uh, you know, I I talk about. Uh, I, I take it back to the things that CRT talks about, but CRT not being the source. And I'll point to things, I'll point to the Bible. The Bible is the source for uh, speaking about justice and injustice. And that predates CRT, you know, by thousands of years. And, you know, you, you want to call me a Marxist, you know, it's, what, what I'm talking about, this, this was uh, written down long before Karl Marx existed. So, uh, you know, when, when you start talking about CRT, it just becomes political noise and people get lost in it. And so I try to take them back to the, uh, 
the core justice issues that are trying to be solved by CRT and extract it to as much possible from CRT itself. Well, uh, you know, my point of view on this is that um, the debates that the debates, and I would I would put that in quotes that people are having about critical race theory, are not really about critical race theory. And so um, the question I always have is, what are you really talking about? Because critical race theory, um, what what that actually is, is that it, that's a set of ideas and concepts that were developed to talk about how criminal justice systems were originally constructed and how systemic racism mm -hmm. lives in them. And then it was extended to educational systems and other systems. But all of that discussion is like a college level discussion. Nobody is teaching critical race theory in high school and certainly not in elementary school. So why are people getting upset about this thing that is not happening in their schools? What they're trying to do is they're trying to take the term critical race theory and use that as a scary boogeyman uh, and redefine it as discussion about systemic racism. And what they really want to do, and I'm sure you guys know this, many of you on this uh, call, they want to intimidate educators and historians like you out of talking about systemic racism. And so what we have to do is constantly ask, what are you really talking about? Because critical race theory is not being taught in high schools or elementary schools. But the, the history of racism in America and the systemic nature of it is under discussion. And once, uh, once teachers in those level uh, of schools feel intimidated out of actually talking about the truth of American history, then we're back to the situation that we saw in Jim Crow uh, era America, where uh, Confederate heroes are glorified and the true nature of the Civil War isn't really discussed. And we're, we're, we're avoiding all of these important elements of our own history. Um, it may seem as if talking about critical race theory <clears throat> will create this um, you know, this rabbit hole that you go down that you can't get out of, but we cannot avoid talking about what is actually happening here. What's actually happening is that activists are going to school board meetings and they're trying to intimidate school boards and school administrators and teachers and historians. And so what I would suggest for the people who are on this call is that if you're feeling that pressure, find a way to reach out to allies who can help you resist. For example, uh, I am uh, the chair of the media monitoring committee for the National Association of Black Journalists. The National Association of Black Journalists is an, a, a national group of journalists of color, uh, uh, other journalists too, we have, we have many white members, but the focus of the group is um, uh, equality in news coverage by making sure that black journalists have all the opportunities that they should have and that there's uh, all the newsrooms across America are as diverse as they possibly can be. And so part of what we do is we engage in the struggle to support people who want to tell the truth about history and tell the truth about news events. And so um, our group is one group that you can turn to if you're having problems and if we can't help you, we'll connect you uh, to, to a group um, that can help. So don't be intimidated. Don't be fooled by this debate and press forward on talking about the issues of systemic racism in American history uh, without responding to this false um, debate about critical race theory. Right, because I do have a comment in the chat that I wanna kind of have you address because this person, I guess, has stated that they feel like that their school is, is teaching critical race theory by using the term diversity and inclusion. And I have an issue with that statement. And I don't know if you wanna kind of, if you would mind addressing that because it's not the same thing. Well, yeah, I would ask that person, why do they think it's critical race theory? Because um, I think that's the problem. I think people come, anytime you have this conversation about race and people get uncomfortable it's easy to use some acronym that somebody thought of versus actually, as you said, have the real 
conversation, look at the real resources, really understanding what it really is. It's not, I think that's the problem. I think a lot of the diversity and inclusion efforts um, that are being done in the history field, as well as in other fields, in journalism, wherever, that is being conflated into, well, that's just critical race theory. And it's just, it's just not, that's not true. Yeah, talk, being honest about the history of racism in America and being honest about how systemic racism works in America is not critical race theory. There, are, there have been books written about critical race theory. If you wanna understand exactly. what, what it actually is, you can go on Amazon and buy a book and read it. Uh, in my book, um, Race Bader, um, people think that this debate about critical race theory is new. Uh, my book came out in 2012, and in it, I talk about how the editor of Breitbart.com, the guy who was editor of Breitbart.com back then, Joel Pollack, uh, went on to Sean Hannity's show on Fox News Channel um, sometime, I think it was in 2012, but the, the, the book has the particulars. Uh, to try and allege that Barack Obama was friends with Derek Bell, um, the professor who was considered the black professor who was considered a pioneer of critical race theory uh, back when he was in college at Harvard, and they had um, a video of Obama hugging him and introducing him at some event. Uh, and so, so Hannity tried to press this idea that critical race theory was some th thing that people should be scared of some pernicious uh, ideology way back in 2012. And people um, didn't respond to it because it didn't make any sense. It was, it was nonsensical. When you, when you dig into what Derek Bell, um, his actual work on critical race theory, you see it's sort of high level thinking about how American institutions were crafted, particularly criminal justice institutions. Now, he had some very controversial ideas, uh, but some of them are worth considering, including this, this notion that it is tough to get, it's tough for people of color to get progress on equality unless the majority culture, white people, feel like they get something out of it too. Uh, and, and, and that is something um, that civil rights activists have long considered in developing their strategies for trying to push uh, for equality, figuring out a way to show white people that it's in their interest to support these things as well. Um, so there's some valuable things in critical race theory um, that should be talked about and should be incorporated into the civil rights struggle. But point of fact, I mean, it's like, it's like complaining that math teachers are teaching trigonometry to elementary school students. There may be some small element or concept that they may mention a few times in class to prepare their kids for when they will actually tackle trigonometry. But nobody's trying to teach trigonometry to fourth graders. <laughs> we would think it was right. silly, right? So, so why are we maintaining this debate? Because people know that it's not an honest debate. It's not, um, it, it's not an earnest debate. This, this is about, this is about fear monger and it's time to turn away from that. So I have a few questions. Um, I think they were kind of more related to our arch archivists in the um, audience. So basically just a general question, what can we do uh, to help with this work as, as history professionals and archivists? Yeah, the thing that's important is to constantly hold up the standard of developing your ideas and concepts about America and what it stands for based on the actual history, what actually happened, what people actually said. How do we know that the Civil War was fought for slavery? Because the Confederates said it themselves. And there's plenty of speeches where you can go and see that that's exactly what they said about why they were fighting the Civil War. How do we know that the reason Texas left uh, Mexican control and joined the union was so that slaveholders there could, pre could preserve slavery. We know it because they said it. <laughs> so, so, so let's, let's um, archivists can help us insist on developing our ideas about American history based on fact, what people said back then, what we know happened and can prove happened. 
Um, there, there's too much theorizing that's based on what people want to believe rather than what um, the historical record actually says. An archivist can help us unearth that record and communicate it to people so that they understand that these concepts that I've been talking about are, are rooted in facts. They're, they're not just things I want to believe. They're things that I've observed because I found the facts to support um, the, um, the concepts that I'm putting forward. Dave, you have a comment? Yes, I think anything that can be done that uh, makes us aware of history that we're just not even aware of. Here in Cincinnati, a major event was the Kenyon Bar Project in the 50s. The city, using federal money, razzed a big section of Black Cincinnati, and it basically destroyed uh, Black Cincinnati. And very few of uh, my white peers today even know that it existed. I'd learned about it. You know, I've only lived in Cincinnati since I was uh, 22, but I didn't learn about it until three years ago myself. And so, you know, getting us in touch with, with uh, major historical incidents. Yeah, I think that's good. I mean, and both of you guys have made me think about how, um, as a plug for our history connection, <laughs> is that our affiliation with the National um, History um, Program that basically is like a, um, a I call it science for uh, history students, but having kids be a part of that uh, national program or either local programs that are in each of the regions of Ohio and other states, when people, you know, when kids are get involved in National History Day, they learn how to use primary sources and how to do the research. And that may be a way, you know, to maybe encourage more students to be a part of the National History Day program and other types of missions like this so kids do learn how to really do the research themselves. Their parents may, I mean, I was very dismayed in hearing all, a lot of these parents who are saying, well, we're gonna start banning books. And if you, if you ban Dr. King's book, A Letter from Birmingham Jail, I don't even get that one. So it's like, these are initiatives that people are just basically saying, we don't wanna learn anything. And I think our role as history professionals, archivists, historians, whoever, is to try to encourage people, no, you need to learn on your own, or at least learn how to do independent study. If you are in a situation where people don't want you to learn things, then strike it on your own and encourage that independent thinking. I, I do have to say that I think um, our modern media culture is feeding into this problem because, I, um, I mean, I, I love technology. Of course, I love media. And there are so many wonderful things about the media resources that everyone has at their fingertips now. But one byproduct of that is that people can surround themselves with media sources that only uh, speak to them on their level, that constantly reassure them that the way that they see the world is the way the world is, and creates a, a, a bubble, um, a cultural bubble, uh, in which nothing penetrates that challenges their worldview. And, and so I think this drive to sort of uh, squelch talking about systemic racism or um, the history of racism in America in, in high schools and elementary schools or um, this idea of banning certain books that make people uncomfortable. I think that's all uh, part of this growing, um, you know, I call it on-demand attitude where people are, they want the media they want, when they want it, how they want it, where they want it. And they want media that constantly and consistently shows them the world the way they want to see it. And, um, and, and, and people have to get used to being challenged sometimes by points of view that, um, that indicate that the world might not be the way, um, fully the way that you want to see it, that it might be very different. For example, um, NPR has done uh, polling. Uh, this was a few years ago that it came out, but um, you know, half of Americans believe that white people are just as likely to be discriminated against because of their race as non-white people. Now, if you look at any measure that you wanna look at, any statistical measure you wanna look at, uh, family wealth, um, incarceration rates, health outcomes, 
Uh, there are dozens of different indicators you can look at to see that people of color um, still have a long way to go to achieve parity with white people. But a lot of white people don't believe that. <laughs> and, so, and so part of the education that has to happen is to let people know that, that even though you feel something, that doesn't mean that it's true. And you have to disregard the people who are telling you that because you feel something, it is true. And, and one of the chief proponents of that, I'm sad to say, is our former president, Donald Trump. Well, unfortunately, we're, all, we're at 1.30, and I want to thank both of you for this very interesting and stimulating discussion. I also want to ask the audience to please uh, support the Society of Ohio Archivists. Uh, you go to their Facebook page, as well as this uh, particular video will be um, on their uh, YouTube page. We also have a link for a uh, survey that will, if, we, if you don't get a chance to see the link today, it'll be sent out um, as some post information that we'll send out after the um, program today. So thank you to the Society of Ohio Archivists, to Deborah, Sherry, and Amy, and everybody else who worked on this program. This was a very uh, great discussion. And we hope you, and I, I see that it is in the chat, well, the, the evaluation is in the chat right now, but it will be sent out to everyone um, as a follow-up email. So thank you so much for coming today and have a great King holiday and learn something more about Black History during Black History Month. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very it. much.